Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor and a treat uh, to be part of this conversation. Thank you uh, to all those who've made it happen. And um, thank you, Dr. Appiah, for making time uh, for this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. My, I, I see my task as um, attempting to let others hear sort of from the inside, as it were, how I, as a Christian, think about issues of pluralism, toleration, and the common good. And in that sense, my, I, I have to say my primary goal is probably to deconstruct maybe some caricatures that are out there and misperceptions. And so um, I, I'm, gonna, uh, um, I'm gonna sort of go after why and how, uh, as a Christian, I have an account of these things. I think Christianity is committed to four key convictions that function as the parameters that inform our understanding of pluralism, our commitment to the common good, and our practice of toleration. These are four, if, if uh, in another sense, I might call these four sort of biblical uh, themes or motifs that shape now how, as a Christian, I think about these. The first is this. There is an affirmation of pluralism of a certain sort that is built into the very biblical narrative itself. So the creator has given us a world in which a thousand flowers bloom and God takes delight in their difference. He takes delight in a wide array of cultural diversity. Indeed, it's interesting in the biblical narrative uh, that we share with other Abrahamic traditions as well, uh, one of the reasons why God responds to the vaunted efforts of the Tower of Babel, in fact, is not just because of hubris, but actually because the Tower of Babel represents a homogenizing effort to colonize everyone under, it says, one tongue. So, in fact, the God who scatters at Babel is in, on the side of diversity, in a sense, and that's woven into the biblical narrative itself. Secondly, the biblical vision of flourishing is one of creation-wide shalom, is the Hebrew word that the prophet Jeremiah and other prophets would describe. It's a vision of creation-wide shalom. This, this is a vision of peaceful order in which people and the planet realize their fullness and potential. And it's a vision not only of right order, but I would also emphasize it's a vision of abundance. It's a hope for a renewed creation in which there is no more hunger, no more pain, no more lack. Indeed, the very good news that Jesus announces in his first sermon, as it were, in Luke chapter 4, was from the very beginning, for example, good news for the poor. So it's uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that in, in a Christian understanding of these things, uh, um, Christianity uh, uh, is concerned not only with souls, but also with bellies, you might say. It's, it is, I, I want to emphasize, this biblical vision, this Christian understanding is a fundamentally holistic vision. In this sense, I want to suggest that Christianity is a humanism of a certain sort. That is, we believe that creatures flourish when people and institutions and systems run with the grain of the universe, in a sense. Third, it's important to note that Christian faith is inherently eschatological. Now, I, so this is, I have to apologize, this is the one insider baseball term that I want to kind of use uh, this evening, so let me explain. Um, Christian faith is inherently eschatological. What does that mean? Integral to the biblical narrative is an account of what we call last things. The Greek word here is eschaton. So an eschatology is like your vision of the end, your vision of last things. And Christianity is fundamentally a religion of hope that longs for this vision of shalom, this creation-wide flourishing, to be realized. That's what I mean when I say that Christianity is inherently an eschatological religion. Not as some end times escape from this world, but actually as a this-worldly realization of the shalom that God wants. 
So this is why, uh, again, uh, popular uh, sort of renditions of this don't do us any favors. But if you actually read the Bible and get to the end, in Revelation 21 and 22, uh, the scriptures envision, in fact, a new earth, not a heavenly hijacking, okay? And even more importantly, and this is actually a lot, a lot that I want to think through with you tonight uh, hinges on this point. Because Christianity is an eschatological religion of hope for this fullness in the future, it's also important to emphasize that we don't believe that this is something we can realize through our own efforts, right? That is, uh, and, and admittedly, I will be the first to admit that I think uh, Christians at different times and in different places have got this wrong, have forgotten uh, this part of the biblical narrative. So, so we work in hope of that kind of vision of flourishing and fullness for the whole of creation. We work in hope towards that, but there is also built into Christianity a fundamental sense of waiting for that kingdom to come. That leads me to this fourth conviction, this fourth parameter, if you will. It's precisely because this eschatology is integral to Christian faith that Christians have a nuanced account of the meantime in which we find ourselves, right? That is, what, what we're, the question and the conversation we're having right now finds us in this meantime between praying for thy kingdom come and waiting for its arrival. And the best thinking in the Christian tradition has always had a nuanced account of what it means to inhabit this time. St. Augustine, or some will say St. Augustine, a North African fifth century thinker, who in some ways you might describe as one of our earliest political philosophers in the Christian tradition, one of the earliest theorists of civil society in the Christian tradition, he described this meantime in which we find ourselves as the seculum, the seculum from which we get the word secular. But it's a time. It's the seculum is the contested time from the fall of humanity to the return of Christ in which we as humans still bear responsibility for the organization of human society but come to that shared collaborative work with different fundamental convictions. This understanding of the seculum means that Christians actually expect disagreements and don't expect the realization of kingdom come based on our efforts or policies or political machinations. We keep praying thy kingdom come. This is what Christians regularly pray, what we sometimes call the Lord's Prayer, in which one of the, the lines that we repeat is thy kingdom come. And we keep praying that precisely because we know it's not here yet. So in light of those sort of four motifs and convictions, how do those parameters shape a Christian understanding of pluralism toleration and pursuit of the common good. I'll, I'll try to summarize this briefly in just two themes. First of all, Christians in public life want to bear witness to what I'm calling the grain of the universe. That is, we want to invite our neighbors to find wholeness and fullness in the norms and order that we believe are invitations to flourishing. We believe that there is a kind of normative set of goods that are inscribed into the very structure of creation and that creation and creatures flourish when they move in that direction. So we believe that there is a normative telos, a normative end or goal of human nature that is not of our own choosing. We don't get to just make this up. And that we actually find liberation and fullness when we live in the grooves of that grain, so to speak. So precisely because we love our neighbors, we will testify to these norms. We'll invite others to uh, uh, find their flourishing in those parameters and, and even hope for policies that perhaps nudge people in that direction, to use Cass Sunstein's language. Secondly and finally, because we are in the seculum, however, we expect disagreement. We realize that not everyone affirms the same goods or telos. Indeed, we live in an age where we think 
uh, where, where people think that they can determine their own telos, and we have a fundamental disagreement with that, obviously. But a Christian response is not to impose homogeneity, that was the Tower of Babel strategy, but rather to show how and why going against the grain of the universe only frustrates flourishing. Our, so in that sense, I would say our toleration is admittedly temporal. That is, it stems not from some relativist indifference, but rather from a disciplined conviction that we are, as Paul writes, to wait for the sun. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I want to start by talking about a man called Sir Richard Burton. Not the one you may have heard of, the 20th century actor, but a 19th century person who uh, was the first, as far as we know, the first uh, Christian to go to Mecca. Uh, now, of course, in order to do that, he had to pretend to be a Muslim because non-Muslims are not supposed to go to Mecca. And he was able to pretend to be a Muslim because he spoke Pashto, because he had spent a good deal of time in, in, on the northwest frontier of India uh, in, in, the, in what's now Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, he was also the first person to translate into English the um, the Arabian Nights and the Perfume Garden and the Kama Sutra, so he was able to translate from a number of South Asian languages. He wrote a very sympathetic account of a trip to visit the Mormons in Utah. Uh, he was one of the first Europeans to write about the place where I grew up in Ghana, Asante, uh, because he traveled there in West Africa, and he was with Speak, one of the two candidates for being the first European to identify uh, Lake Victoria as the source of the Nile. So this man traveled a lot of places and was, uh, a, spoke 30 or 40 languages um, and, and, as I say, translated important works out of uh, uh, Arabic and Persian, uh, as well as being able to speak Pashto and uh, go to Mecca when he wanted to. Now, in, uh, he, and he, he, he was also a poet, and he wrote a poem uh, which he put in the, in the voice of an, uh, a non-existent, an imaginary Sufi, from Yazd in Persia, a man he called Haji Yabdu. And it was written, it was written in English, but it was meant to, uh, it was pretending to be a translation of Qasidas, which is a, which is a, a, a long established uh, Arabic poetic form. And, and in the voice of this Sufi mystic, he says at one point, truth is the shattered mirror strewn in myriad bits while each believes his little piece the whole to own. Truth is the shattered mirror strewn in myriad bits while each believes his little piece the whole to own. I like Sir Richard, uh, Sir Richard Burton, by the way, was a typical Victorian Englishman, so apart from being tolerant of Mormons and able to pretend to be a Pashtu and able to get into Mecca, he was also racist, sexist, homophobic probably, uh, though the reason his wife destroyed his papers was probably that there was evidence in them that he was gay. But anyway, he was, I'm not saying he was a saint. I'm not saying that I agree with everything he thought. But I am saying that I think that someone who had that experience of the world, who had lived among Mormons, who was, who was himself a Catholic in, in England, which was not a very Catholic country in the 19th century, was quite hostile to Catholics, and who had spent time in India learning about Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam, I'm saying that someone like that might, might be in a good position. We might want to trust him when he says that he's traveled widely and he's seen that the truth, uh, that there's a little bit of the truth everywhere, but most people in most places think they've got more of it than they have. I think that that insight, which uh, is uh, a kind of poetic expression of a long philo old philosophical idea, the idea of fallibilism, the idea that each of us is uh, not strongly able to discover the truth all by ourselves, that other people, that we are, we are likely to be wrong about things, uh, as well as right about things, uh, that idea is a very important idea in the background of, what I'm, uh, of cosmopolitanism, which is what I'm going to now try to define for you. And I want to begin by saying that the word cosmopolitan comes from cosmopolites, which is Greek for citizen of the world, and it's a very old phrase that, it goes back at least to Diogenes the Cynic, um, which is, you know, four centuries before the Common Era. But um, I'm going to tell you what I think we should use this idea of global citizenship for. Other people have defined cosmopolitanism in other ways. I'm not claiming that this is the only way to think about it. I'm just telling you my story. My story is this, that 
if you're going to be a global citizen, you've got to have some commitment to the idea of a certain universality, that, that the, all human beings matter, perhaps all sentient creatures matter, but certainly all human beings matter, and they matter in the same sorts of ways. So that the fact that you're my neighbor or my, a member of my family uh, may give me special interest in you, but every human being matters, and that's a fundamental, uh, that's a fundamental idea. Now, this idea, this idea of universality is widely shared. Lots and lots of people believe that Catholics are universalists too. Indeed, the word Catholic means universal. Um, so I'm not saying that this is, this is distinctive of cosmopolitanism, but it's an important point about cosmopolitanism because, um, like Dr. Smith, I'm not a relativist. I don't think that there are no universal values. I think there are universal values, and I think cosmopolitanism should embrace that idea. Second, and this is more distinctive, Despite the fact that everybody matters, uh, people are nevertheless entitled to make their own way in the world, to live their own lives, to live lives, to, to find meaning in the ways that make most sense to them. There isn't one way for human beings to live. There are many ways for human beings to live, both within a society and across societies. And so it's built into cosmopolitanism that we expect, indeed, we enjoy a great diversity of styles of life among human beings. Um, we celebrate diversity, but that celebration is constrained by universality, so that if somebody wants to be diverse in ways that threaten the flourishing of people who live in other ways, then we're, no, we're not their friend, we're their enemy. We have standards. We're, we're drawing the boundaries in certain places, but we're open to uh, a wide range of ways of life. If we're going to live like that, I think I, I, there are many things that I think, I wrote a whole book about this, so I think there are many strands that can be drawn out of this idea, but here are two important ones. Uh, one is that um, if that's your view, if you're a fallibilist and you believe that people are entitled to live their own lives, then you'll be very interested in talking to people who disagree with you as well as in talking to people who agree with you. You'll want to share, you, you'll want to learn from other people, and you'll expect that they might have things to learn from you. Conversation, then, across identities, across disagreements, is one of the things that cosmopolitanism of my sort value. And we value it because we can learn from it, because we hope that other people can learn from it. But also, um, we value it in a way that means we're going to go on with it, whether we come to agreement or not. We're not interested in persuading everybody else around to our point of view, uh, because, as I say, we think there are legitimate ways in which people have uh, can find difference. Uh, different uh, modes of flourishing, different modes of meaning finding, and so on. And the second thing I want to draw out uh, just briefly is that um, it, part of this, there's a reason why cosmopolitanism is associated with, with the aesthetic, with, with attitudes to literature and music and the arts. It's because a, that cosmopolitan temperament is going to make you aesthetically interested in other ways of going on. You may, I, I can't uh, appreciate uh, Peking uh, uh, opera in the way that I can appreciate uh, uh, Verdi because I've had my ear has much less training for that kind of music. But I'm really interested in the possibility that I might come to appreciate that. I'm really interested in the possibility that I might come to appreciate kinds of music that I don't currently understand. I'm very interested in representational forms in the other arts, in, in the plastic arts, in dance and so on, which are different from the ones that I already know. And I'm expecting that the world of my life, the world of my aesthetic experience, is going to be enriched by interactions of that kind. So conversation, sharing, but also a framework of universality, a framework of fundamental, I would say, human rights that must be recognized by everybody. And so I'm willing to fight for those. I'm willing to defend the human right, my own human rights and the human rights of all other human beings. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. I believe that sometimes that may involve uh, violence. But most of the time, I'm thinking if we converse with one another in this open way, in this way that doesn't require, that isn't about coming to agreement, it's about sharing, not about agreeing, Agreement is fine, I don't, I'm not, I don't object to agreements, but I don't object to conversations which aren't about agreement either. Uh, if we go on in this way, I don't think there'll be need for much violence in the world. Now, I uh, don't have the uh, hope the, uh, that, is, uh, that is the consequence of the theological commitments of 
uh, of Christians, as in fact of all the Abrahamic faiths, and for that matter, uh, of, of many other faiths outside the Abrahamic tradition, uh, because I don't believe that the universe is um, on a side. I think we have to be on a side. We have to pick sides uh, uh, for the good, for human flourishing, for giving each other the right to live in the ways that seem best to, to us, subject to the constraint that we respect each other's rights. But uh, I am hopeful, not because I think the universe is on the side of these things, because I believe that human beings can be persuaded to be on the side of these things, and that we are organizable into groups that will resist those who can't. Dr. Apio. So we're going to open this now to discussion. We're going to have some short back and forth between uh, our two speakers. I have some questions, but to some extent I also want this to be a free flow exchange of ideas. Um, I have one question for you, and then I'm going to leave it to you. I'm, I'm going to just grill you a little bit on what you've just said. So you describe cosmopolitanism in two ways, that it's, that there is a, there's, there's some universal principles, you're not a relativist. Um, and the second one was, um, pop quiz, the second one was, what was the second one? Conversation. Conversation. Conversation, going, going after the difference, right. To me, that just sounds like being a cultured person, like that's a, like that is, you're describing a quality of person as opposed to a kind of, not ideology, but set of principles that you, that, that has a stamp on a person. What if there's, when there's conflict between two people or between two cultures, what if there is, what if there are serious wounds where it's sharing art is not gonna do it, it may be a beginning of a conversation. My question to you is, let's get deep into the resources of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, a seven syllable word. What are the resources that cosmopolitanism offers to actually bring about the world that you're describing that we all want, as opposed to just saying that it is the world we all want? Um, well, I'm not sure it is the world everybody wants uh, yet. Uh, I think there are people in the world who, that's why I wanted to contrast the universalism of the cosmopolitan with other forms of universalism, because there's another kind of universality, which is homogenizing that aims to make everybody the same as it were as soon as possible. And that could be in the name of capitalism, it could be in the name of, of uh, Salafi Islam, it could be in the name of a lot of different things. But, uh, uh, so, uh, if I could get everybody to agree with where we've got to, the thing you think is that everybody shares, I'd be really happy, uh, because a lot of the problems of the world would go away. But, um, to get there, uh, and, and I mentioned the connection between, between cosmopolitanism and aesthetic, because it's kind of, sort of evident in, 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 if you look at the literature. Uh, on these things. I should say that some of the most cosmopolitan people in the world, that is people who have this double attitude of universality and respect for difference, live in refugee camps and have no money. So it's not about being, uh, and, and they may not have much formal education. This is an attitude to other people, which you can have, I think it's easier to have it, everything's easier if you have money, right? Every moral attitude is easier if you have money, except perhaps generosity. But, um, <laughs> uh, but, so I, so I think that it's, it's uh, I don't want to think of it as just a, a position of the privileged. I think there's some very unprivileged people who have this attitude. And I think that part of the reason they have it is because there is, the, once you have that attitude, you do have a resource for being, for cohabiting with other people, which is that you're not constantly trying to get them to be like you in every, in every way. You're, you're relaxed about the fact that they're not like you. And so you can be with them. And there, look, any two people who disagree about something also agree about something. Uh, don't start with the disagreements. Build, uh, build habitation by talking about whatever it is you share, soccer. Uh, I, I know nobody here shares soccer, but the world is full of people who share soccer. Um, uh, music, uh, uh, literature, whatever it is, uh, fishing, whatever the things are that you can talk about. Build the, the cohabitation, and then when, when the difficulties arise, when the arguments arise, you'll be talking to someone who uh, has, with whom you have this bond. It's not a bond of agreement, it's not a bond of thinking the same about everything, it's the conversational bond. It's the bond that you have with people who you know how to talk to. 
So, so you believe that once people have this bond, that they will inherently have the resources then to work past the difficulties. That, that, that cosmopolitanism doesn't in itself offer that, it's in, already there. Um, I think there's enough of us like that. Uh, I, there are people who don't care for difference. Uh, some of them are organized in Mennonite communities in Pennsylvania. Some of them are organized in ultra-Orthodox communities in Jerusalem. Uh, some of them are living on Wall Street. There are lots of people who don't care much for difference. Uh, but there's enough of us who do, and we can make more, because th here's the truth about cosmopolitanism. It's fun. It's enjoyable. You get to, you get to, look, you get to watch movies with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Smith, uh, by Dr. Appiah's definition, are you a cosmopolitan? Yeah, I think so in many ways. I mean, one of the things that I remember so strikingly from very early on in uh, Dr. Appiah's book, Cosmopolitanism, is his citation of a letter uh, from St. Paul to the Galatians in which he says, those who are in Christ are neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. There's th this is actually a, a very, very deep strain uh, in the Christian tradition, which is that once your citizenship is in the heavenly city, the city of God, you act, it actually kind of relativizes your citizenship in other earthly polities. So that I was thinking of another second century epistle to Diognetus in which he describes, he says, Christians are like at home everywhere because they're at home nowhere. There, there, there's a different, there's a kind of flexibility that, that has a, because the church is such a transnational reality in and of itself, it's a Catholic reality. Uh, I, I just think there's so much to affirm there. Now, I, I do wonder if there'd be an interesting conversation about whether uh, a kind of secular cosmopolitanism is only possible and envisioned insofar as it lives off the borrowed capital of a universalism that was unleashed by Christianity. So th this is kind of Charles Taylor's account of what he calls the modern moral order, in which you know, the kinds of things that you, know, you are saying, well, so many people take these for, things for granted, and, and Dr. Abby rightly says, well, not everybody takes for granted, but even if they are, can be taken for granted as sort of secular commitments, how much is that because there's a genealogy of its having emerged from, and this is a less friendly way of be putting it, but is somewhat parasitic on, actually, resources that were unleashed by biblical traditions that then came to be uh, um, characteristic of the West or however we might describe that, that then make it possible to slough off some of the particulars but still have the ethos uh, of, say, concern for human dignity. That, to me, sounds like image of God language that's been formalized into a secular concept. Is that, is that too it. far in the weeds to talk about? That's or? exactly where we want to go. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Right. So okay. I, Response. Uh, Two things. One, um, I, uh, because cosmopolitanism is about these conversations across differences, of course, one form of cosmopolitan is, is a Christian and a post-Christian cosmopolitanism that draws on these resources. I, I would be the last person to want to deny, for example, that it's important that Kant grew up you know, a Christian back, against Christian background, and that he who, more than any other Western philosopher, uh, brought, brought us to the point where we foreground notions of dignity, uh, it only makes sense, I think, against that background. I mean, he, his own understanding of the relationship to philosophy and theology is very complicated, but, but he's certainly, we, we looking at him must say, this is a person who, who's a, he's a post, he's a Christian, he's a philosopher of Christian background, and you can't, in the end, make sense of it unless you accept that. So I agree with that. Um, I should say, by the way, that St. Paul, I think, is a philosopher of Stoic background, of pagan backgrounds. And so Christianity itself has debts uh, earlier than, uh, than, than, uh, than, than the time of Christ, uh, well, especially around the time of Christ, but when Stoicism was the dominant intellectual form of educated people in the Eastern Empire. But um, so uh, I think that we, could, we don't need to deny that. The question, the more difficult question, is not, so I, I agree completely on the historical question. There's a much more difficult and, and, I think, genuinely challenging question, which is, to what extent is there a kind of um, 
sociological or psychological dependence uh, on that uh, Christian framework to undergird these commitments. Um, and I should speak frankly, I mean, I was, I was raised in a, in a Christian church. Uh, I, uh, uh, I was a devout evangelical, uh, I would say in the good sense, uh, evangelical Christian until I was 17 or 18. I believed that it was good news. I wanted to share it with people. Uh, it was a tolerant, loving form of good news, uh, but, but it was a, and it was deeply grounded in, in a theological foundation. I find myself able to continue with those thoughts without the theological foundation. So I imagine a society in which that's possible. And I certainly have friends who didn't have that background, who have no religious background, who have exactly the sort of commitments that actually we share uh, without the theological history. So I can't claim to know that I could get to where I am without Christianity, because I didn't. Um, I, I, I feel I've gone beyond Christianity, not in the sense of being better than Christianity, but I mean, I've left Christianity and I still have these views, and I think that's possible. What a society would look like in which nobody was Christian or Jewish or Muslim, and we tried to have these conversations, I don't know. I, I admit that. That's something. my next question. Is, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, my, and it's just a genuine, honest question. So what, one of the things I appreciate about your account of cosmopolitanism is it doesn't mean that cosmopolitans are these free-floating abstract entities. In fact, you affirm, unlike I think some liberals, you, philosophical liberals, you affirm the good of rooted, thick communities of formation, as would I, and, and in a way what I would want to argue is in many ways, the particularities of communities of Christian formation are some of the best incubators to create cosmopolitans who have the kind of concern for others that, that you're interested in. And my question is, does, does a kind of generic secularism actually have anything like a thick community of practice that can engender that going forward? So um, I think there can be thin and unhelpful forms of secularity. But uh, Bernie Sanders, who I'm actually not going to vote for, um, <laughs> uh, nevertheless articulated very well, I think, last weekend, a way of thinking about Jewish tradition, which is, I don't know how clear he was about this, because it, um, you're not allowed to be clear about atheism if you're an American politician. <laughs> but it was a form of deep social commitment that I recognize as part of modern Jewish tradition that is not theological that is sustained beyond, uh, beyond uh, the theological forms of Judaism, which of course also exists in, in great proliferation too. So I, um, I believe that it is possible to develop deep forms of community that are not grounded in, uh, uh, in theology. Uh, I believe, for example, that some of the, the righteous Gentiles who helped Jews escaped from Nazism were grounded in such communities which were socialist and an atheist. Uh, so I think it is possible, um, but I agree that it's possible to have a kind of thin um, identity, an identity that's unrooted, and that I myself think that uh, human beings do better when we're in thicker relations than that, more, more rooted relations. Though I don't think you have to be in just one. I think one of the nice uh, one of the good things about the contemporary world is that it's full of people, uh, just I'm rambling on here, but I'm, I have, so I, I'm half Ghanaian and half English. My sister married, in a, well, one sister married a Norwegian, the other married a Nigerian. My nephews, who are half Nigerian and half anglo ghanaian or half Norwegian and half anglo ghanaian they are rooted definitely more than one place. They speak beautiful uh, Norwegian uh, in one case and good Yoruba in the other case. They, they, they have the kind of bilingualism uh, that, uh, that, that uh, you know, gives you a kind of double perspective on the world. But, but, and, but the, and they love at least two places, um, in some cases three. So, so I don't mean it has to be one place, but I think that sense that I belong here, I belong there, which I definitely have about the part of England that my mother came from and the part of Africa that my father came from. I don't live in either of them, but when I'm there I think, oh, this is where I came from. Okay, I have a question. We're Canadian. Does that count for anything? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> sorry. It's cold. Cold there. Okay, so here's 
I want to go off something that you said earlier. You said that you grew up in a Christian home. And then you said a particularly tolerant, loving version of Christianity. So I want to pick on that a little bit. Is, I think a lot of people would say that Christianity, especially when we're talking about toleration, is intrinsically intolerant. That the whole concept of even evangelizing, turning people into Christians as fundamental um, to the faith, uh, is inherently um, opposed to the concept of um, tolerance. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying many people perceive that, but you said a tolerant version of Christianity. So I want to frame this question for both of you, uh, and what I really want you to do is talk about the other person's view at this point, at your own and the others. There, I think, is are two um, ideas that are in conflict. One is a world's views, a world views power to do something, to change. We see that Christianity has had a deep influence um, on this culture. And on the other end, uh, how specific it is. It can, in a sense, do that because it's very specific. So I would say that Christianity is, has been very powerful and very specific, which is kind of against tolerance or might be perceived that way. As opposed to maybe cosmopolitanism, many people might be thinking that um, it's not very specific. I mean, it's universal and at the same time, therefore, is sapped of power to actually do anything. So can you uh, speak to, to that or anything else that you like? No, speak to that. James, go. Uh, what do I want to say? I, um, I mean, I do think, since Anthony emphasized that he is not a relativist and therefore thinks that there are universal norms that are goods that impinge on everyone, I would think as soon as we get to a point in which he asserts that, Whoever is complaining about the coercive, you know, intolerant nature of Christianity in the one sphere would have to now lay that charge at his feet. Okay, except that it's a spectrum of specificity. So his universality is actually a very low bar. I mean, it's don't harm people and things like that, as opposed to get them to confess that Jesus rose from the dead, which is pretty specific. Yeah, but that, that, would be a, that would be a particularly odd thing to claim that Christians are intolerant about because the very nature of proclamation is that it is an invitation to respond. It's not an imposition to convert at the sword or something like that, right? So that, that when, if I extend that invitation to a neighbor, it's actually only because I think that in Christ, they will find out how to best be human, right? So for me, it's, it's not like, oh, this is gonna like ruin your weekend. It's, <laughs> it's this, is, this is actually, here is an invitation and a call to actually find what you were made for and to flourish. Um, and, but I, I mean, and now the ball's in your court. So I, I, it's hard for me to see how that would be um, guilty of intolerance. It's, it simply shares with cosmopolitanism a, a thick understanding of the good of being human. So I just want to say that uh, uh, I'm going to maybe find something to disagree with in that, which will cheer you up. But, um, <laughs> but um, I think it's important that, that I don't believe that cosmopolitanism is an identity exactly. I'm a, I'm a cosmopolitan, post-Christian, anglo and homosexual and I could tell you more. I have, we all have complicated identities. Cosmopolitan is just part of it, it's, and it's not, it, it's precisely not in a way the deepest part. I believe profoundly in the things I've just said, but to make those work, I have to have other things that I believe in. I have to have the content to the universal standard and so on. Um, so, um, so yes, by, uh, I, I think a kind of thin cosmopolitan identity on its own isn't going to do the work of shaping significant human life, I agree with that. Here's the thing that I do think is, can be laid at the, the feet of Christianity as a, as a problem, perhaps. Um, uh, the thing about Christianity, especially as it was originally formed, is that it was more preoccupied than either Stoicism or um, Rabbinic Judaism, which developed, of course, a little bit after the time of Christ, um, more preoccupied with creedal questions and with defining identity through rather complex creeds. So if you, if you think about um, the, 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 the main, the sort of Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed, the main creeds of the early church, just to understand them, 
you have to have a PhD in philosophy I would argue because for example they talk about substance being of one substance with the father by whom all things were made uh, incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary that's a very complicated idea and the thought was if you didn't believe all that you were on the wrong side of the universe and the wrong side of history I think and I think many people of my sort of post-religious disposition think, it's really hard to get those things correct. So the idea that the correct answer has been found and that we, my group, know it, it's not that it leads to intolerance because part of the content of what you think you know may be that you shouldn't be intolerant, but it does have a kind of attitude to knowledge that I myself don't share. I am, uh, one reason why, I mean, I, I'm not a theist, that is to say, I, I Known credo in unum deum. I do not believe in, in one God. But, but I'm not totally convinced of that. I'm not like, sh you know, because it's, it's a very hard question. Just understanding what that would mean is hard. And I do think that there's, a, there's, there's part of the history of Christianity, which Christianity weaned itself away from in Europe after the wars of religion, after the Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War and the War of Spanish Succession and the English Civil War and so on. These wars which were about religion. Christians learned and then the rest of us learned with them and from them that it wasn't going to work to live in the world with people who had different views about these things from you to try and persuade them to your point of view with a sword. That wasn't going to work. We have, a hundred, we have the Hundred Years' War, which is about the difference between Protestants and Catholics, and lo, at the end of the Hundred Years' War, well, there were still Protestants and Catholics. And, and I would say... <laughs> And, and, and as a Christian, I would say that the, what was forgotten in that era was precisely Augustine's insight about the seculum, which is people had basically thought, oh no, kingdom has come, and therefore we need to make sure our prince and our our pope are are in sync, and that was just that was just a really really bad idea. I would say I, I would want to complicate that history just a little bit because I actually think. Uh, uh, you, you probably know this formula, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. And I actually think there's something interesting going on that, yes, the, the councils and creeds are fourth, you know, third, fourth, fifth century, but that means Christians are praying and worshiping a long time before they articulate that. And it, it's like there's a belonging that precedes the articulation of the believing, and I think that's important. I think, it's, I think the catechumenate ancient, in an ancient world was an invitation to a, a community of practice uh, and to be part of that. And I, I would also say Christians are supposed to be uh, the community who, when we gather around word and sacrament, word and table, also gather to confess our sins. <laughs> like that's built into what we do. And I think we have, have not always done that well. I mean, um, for, for um, what, what I love is that built into the narrative of scripture itself is something like what you've just said, which is, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I, I, I've, I, I don't think, that struggle that you've just identified is not foreign to followers of Jesus either, right? So No, no, the history of, of, of faith is the history of, of doubt, the history of the, 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 the interesting... Yes. Uh, yes. Very, uh, very so I, I completely agree with that. But I do think that, uh, and I agree with what you just said about the, the, the sort of complicating the story, but um, just, you know, lots of people have forgotten that, I think, at various moments, and, and that's why there's this image of Christian intolerance. Not so much, I would say, about, there's a modern form of Christian intolerance, which is not represented on this stage, uh, about, about sort of sexual matters, for example. The, the form of intolerance that I was thinking about historically is, is interesting because it's intolerance about, about I would say, Theology. Now, you're saying that that's incorrect. I agree that there's a perfectly good Christian tradition that goes the, the other way. The church is the body of Christ in the world. It can keep learning. Yeah. Can, I want, can I ask you one question, question, quick question? So, and it goes to your earlier point. Would you say, I, I have a hunch that you would never describe cosmopolitanism as a worldview. Or would you? It's, it's, to me, it seems more like a posture or something. Yeah. But then is there, 
And yet, you did, you did conclude by saying, you know, I, I mean, you, I, you don't believe what Jamie believes, but you believe something else. Would you say that there is a worldview under cosmopolitanism as a posture? Is that a fair question? Yeah, it's a good question, and the answer, I think, is no. There are many worldviews, sure. all of which have cosmopolitan. So the reason, I mean, one reason for quoting St. Paul is that I, I think of him as you do, as having, I think we agree. I mean, we don't agree exactly, but we agree that he was someone who both had a deep Christian identity and had this sense, cosmopolitan sense, that at least in the seculum, uh, though that, well, that's not his concept, but at least for now, uh, uh, we're not all going to be the same. We're not going to be. Maybe eventually we'll all be the same, but not 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 in in history before before the eschatology. Okay, we have one more minute, and I have one question for both of you. The question has to do with practices. You mentioned confessing sins around the table. That's a practice. That's something that Christians do. You talked about uh, watching soccer games together and listening to music, which I do not demean at all. That's very holy stuff. So um, in. Uh, just a few sentences, just we have a minute left, 30 seconds each. Can you uh, name a few practices that really are an offering of Christianity, that, that are intrinsic to Christianity? To be a Christian, you must do this, and, and maybe, you know, many Christians do this, and many people other that aren't Christians don't do this. It really is a practice that is, I don't even, you don't like that part. I, I love I love practice. I, I mean, I'm not Christians, sure I totally understand your question. Okay, like I think of Christians singing together every Sunday yes, 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 is yes, a yes. practice that is like special. Yes, that Christians do. That's pretty special. What other things do? And it's also a kind of enacted harmonization oh, of difference yeah. in really, really powerful non-affect or affective ways, right? Yeah, yeah. So, what are some other practices that are going to bring about tolerance mm. and the common mm. good mm. that are? Intrinsic to Christianity, and then I'm going to ask the same question. To so you maybe I mean the, the, I guess I'm, I might repeat what question. I'm saying, but I, I would say um, uh, so. In in historic Christian worship, there's a sort of narrative arc to what we do as a people when we are taken through this biblical story, and I do think actually a really key maybe it's because I'm a Calvinist, but one of the key moments is this this confession you didn't know that. this confession of our sins, <laughs> um, and then hearing. The announcement of God's pardon, the the, the, the um, uh, um, uh, God's mercy is announced in response. I, I just think that's a really important. It, it's what makes me a fallibilist as well. In that, th this is a reminder of my limitations, my failures, uh, that I think then also prompts me to take a posture towards my children, my spouse, my neighbors. Uh, my friends, that, that um, God models to me a kind of acceptance that is incredible, unwarranted, uh, uh, gracious, and uh, super abundant. And I hope that's a practice that's trying to make me the same kind of receiver. Precisely what is the practice? Confession of, uh, oh, the confession. Confession of sins. Okay. And, and, and to and be perfectly just... honest, to do it on my knees is to take a posture of humility in the world. That, that is my body knowing something about humility. Two other practices. No, you said one, it's now it's Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll play ping pong here. I think I'm gonna give you zero, because what I, because uh, for me- Okay, back to you, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, because I, I wanna sort of slightly repoint the question. Um, as I said, cosmopolitanism is, a, is, a, is an attitude, a posture, as you suggested, and so it doesn't come with these things. If you're asking me, Anthony Appiah, what practices I get strength from that I believe can be taken out into the world in these ways, as it happens, uh, we do a Seder every year. So I steal something from a tradition that doesn't belong to me. Now, isn't hospitality... Um Yes. Cosmo Cosmo cosmopolitan writers talk about hospitality. Yes, it's very important. Uh, that is a practice. That is a practice. Bringing people into your house. Yes. So, so the in fact, Kant made this central, uh, Kant fundamental cosmopolitan principle was that you had to protect the stranger when he was with you or she was with you, because she didn't have her government to protect her, which she did, or she should have when she's home. Okay. So, just so, because we're out, we're out of time here. One sentence. We have time for that. You'll have to come. 
Okay, yes, we're getting the... Oh, just, just, I mean, the, what the Seder does, I mean, there are many things that the Seder does, obviously, but one of them is it reminds us uh, uh, to be, uh, I mean, it talks about uh, having been enslaved, having coming, coming out of slavery, and it reminds us to, that we need always to remember that terrible things have happened to people, are happening to people, and that we are privileged if we aren't um, in those such circumstances, and that that imposes upon us obligations to try and make sure it doesn't happen to other people. Well, thank you both. Hi, um, my name is Abhishek, and I'm the co-president of the Secular Student Alliance. Uh, so first of all, thank you guys for coming. So the question is, uh, is cosmopolitanism worse for society than a specific religion, since it doesn't provide a sense of identity or specific rituals that a community can come around? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> But not because it does provide them, but because it's consistent with finding those things in other places, uh, many different places. There's no one way of doing it. It is true that it is a challenge in our kind of society to do that without the automatic framing that you get from thinking of yourself as belonging to a religious tradition. We know how to do that. But, um, but no, it, 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 you can get that from somewhere else. Okay, and yeah, so that's, um, that's sort of a problem that we face at the Secular Student Alliance is that we don't have, you know, that um, very solid you know, founding principle or set of principles that we can all come around that all secular people have in common. So what would, you, what would your advice be for someone that's um, heading a club like mine or in general trying to bring together a community of secular people or cosmopolitans? Um, so it's really hard to kind of invent practices just for the sake of having practices. Um, you could do that, but I think there would be, uh, Auguste Comte actually suggested this for his Church of Positivism. Um, I don't think it works. I think you have to find what's natural for your group to the things you want to do together. There are lots of things you might do together that don't have any religious presuppositions. Um, sharing each other's problems, listening to one another, I mean, there are lots of things you can do, and you can turn them into regular practices, not because you want some practices or other, but because these practices seem useful to you. Thank you very much. Hi, this question is directed to both uh, our speakers, um, but our, our group was talking a lot about group identity, and Professor Apaya, you mentioned that, you know, it was mentioned that the power of group identity uh, and group involvement for Christianity, uh, sort of based in the church, or perhaps, uh, Professor Apia, you said socialism perhaps for cosmopolitanism. And our question was that, you know, in the age, uh, perhaps even the internet, where new group identities are being formed, new ways of connection are being formed every day, uh, do you think that being rooted in a group identity is central to reaching and flourishing individual involvement in society? Or do you think that individualism still has a place in allowing us to interact with each other uh, based on our own terms, sort of what you were talking about with cosmopolitanism, where we can come at problems from our own personal beliefs that we've fostered, or whether these are fundamentally informed by our connection with other human beings. Um, so th this is a slightly complicated topic, but uh, so That's why we uh, asked. Uh, so I don't know that I can uh, I can do this consistently with the requirement that I do in two sentences, but uh, which has been rightly imposed upon us by the moderator. But uh, th there's a sort of short answer, which is that um, what it is to have to be an individual is to have fixed a way, found a way of um, putting together an individuality which you make in part out of the many identities that you bring to bear in your life. So I don't think individuality and identity should be seen as opposed to one another. I think of an identity as one of the resources for our individuality. Okay, thank you. Do you have a follow-up? I was hoping Professor Smith would also respond. Oh, yeah, um, um, I, I think this is a, a very real and genuine challenge. And, um, even someone who wants to uh, um, confess a primary 
or, or orienting Christian identity is always already shaped by multiple identities and multiple communities of practice. So we're always negotiating that. And I, I think that's a pretty common theme in the New Testament, actually, is seeing Christians negotiating that. I do think part of the malaise of, of modernity is actually people being so fragmented by uh, uh, these multiple kind of but very, very thin group affiliations that don't really coalesce into the formation of an identity, of a center uh, uh, that you can lean out from. And, and I think in that sense, not Dr. Appiah's version of cosmopolitanism, but really kind of dilettantish versions of cosmopolitanism do a disservice insofar as they don't give people robust kind of at least centers of gravity to become the sort of individual that, that you're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a question for Dr. Appiah, uh, and this came up a couple of times in the cards. This is personal, so maybe a moment longer than the other answers. What was the reason for your pulling away from Christianity? Well, we were just talking about this. I mean, um, the answer is, I don't think reason is quite the right way to think about it. Um, I was thinking a lot about my Christianity, and, and I was reading a lot of theology and philosophy. I was 16, 15, 16, 17 years old. And one day, it occurred to me, because a friend of mine said, I don't think I believe that anymore, a friend of mine with whom I'd been in the prayer group, um, that, that that was the best explanation for what I was feeling, though I, though I hadn't realized that until that moment. Uh, that suddenly, it sort of, it was like a, as I said, it's like a gestalt switch. It was like, I'd be born again. Uh, I suddenly realized that, the, that from this point of view, given what I'd been thinking about, really given my experience in a Christian family and so on, that, that this was the thing that sort of made sense. That's, that's the answer. So I don't think one should, my own view is that reason isn't, I don't, reason is terribly important to me, I'm a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, and, I, and it, it has its place. But if you ask me how I got to where I am, I can't say that I reasoned my way here. Thank you. This question is for both of you. I'll start with James. I think we'll enjoy this question. How would your worldview, Christianity, or posture, cosmopolitanism, respond to someone like Donald Trump about what he embodies? <laughs> uh, real talk with much abhorrence. Um, uh, I'll give you one example. I, I think it's... It, even if it comes with a veneer that claims to be religious, I think it signals in its xenophobia and nationalism that it's not the kind of cosmopolitanism that Anthony recognized in the New Testament. So I, I just find that it's, it's, it is, um, uh, it's, it's, is that fair? If I say more, it's gonna get worse and I'm gonna regret things that I say. So, <laughs> I mean, um, honestly, does he offend the universal, the low bar, um, universal principles? He, he, he both offends them and uh, articulates the desire to offend more of them. Uh, <laughs> that is to say, I think treating people the way he sometimes does is involves not respecting the human dignity of other people, and I take that to be one of the fundamental universal requirements, and he also wants to torture people and do all kinds of things that I think you ought not to do. So, um, but honestly, I find it hard to take, I mean, I know that the, he's getting all these votes and so on, but I do find it hard to take seriously as a position because we have no idea, since he switches his, says different things on every five minutes, uh, which of these things we're supposed to take seriously as proposals for how we should actually conduct ourselves. Um, I mean, it's, look, if you say you're going to build a wall and then you say the Mexicans are going to pay for it, well, the Mexicans aren't going to pay for it, so are you going to build a wall? I mean, I don't know whether he's going to try, I suppose he were present, would he build a wall? I have no idea. Uh, and so on. Fair enough. You know, You've already given him more time than he does. Yes. <laughs> Question for Dr. Abia. Could a perspective lacking rituals such as Cosmo for short, retain community in a world moving towards individualism? 
Is it able to do it? Can it actually retain the community? Again, I think the answer is not by itself. But that's all right, because cosmopolitanism isn't about um, uh, uh, colonizing your whole self. It's, it's one of the resources that you... So it needs Christianity. Um, for many, for many, no, no, for many people, Christianity is how their cosmopolitanism is grounded. Sure, I, I grant that. Also, Judaism. Or, um, also, some of us have a foundation in a kind of philosophical view that doesn't really belong to any particular religious tradition, though it's connected with many of them. Okay, question for James. Name one moral action performed by a believer that could not have been done by a non-believer. Do, do you want a minute, Shane, to think about that one? That's a good question. Uh, a moral action. Um, well, this is gonna sound like I'm splitting a hair, but I, it's just because I've never thought about this question before. Uh, I would say uh, worship. Because Which, how do you worship, define worship? Well, I mean, as, as a sort the of... worship of God or a worship in let's general? Let's say an adoring response of giving homage and ascribing worth to God. And I'm, I'm claiming that that's a moral act insofar as it's something that's commanded. And in a way, it's, it's a call to all of humanity to do that. And I would think that that requires the posture of faith and a belief, a belief to be able to do that. I, I I feel like there's probably another shoe that drops after that question, but I don't know. Okay. That's a little bit intrinsic to the question, though, isn't it? I mean, that, of course, a non believer can't do that. Yeah, that, wasn't that the question? <laughs> <laughs> you could read into it that way. Um, okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Okay, um, next. This is, again, for you, James. How is Christianity not compelling people? You, you mentioned that it's an invitation, an offer. Yeah. How is it not compelling, however, that you're compelling people if people often say, if you don't believe in this faith, you're going to hell? Um, I guess we'd have to talk in some specificity about what compulsion or coercion is. Um, I would expect that if you don't be respond in belief, then you would think that that claim itself is false. So it would be odd for you to be, feel compelled by something that you don't believe, that I'm claiming is true, right? Yeah? You, in so other words, a, so you're, now you feel compelled by what you take to be a fiction? Right. Um, or you feel coerced by what you must believe is a fiction because you're refusing to believe it. So um, the proper question, that, I mean, it's a believer compelled to worship God because if he doesn't, he'll go to hell, versus a non-believer compelled to become a Christian. Well, I, I, mean, that, I that, hope that, we don't lose, I feel is. like we're falling into an orbit here. Let's keep in mind that Christianity is fundamentally the extension of a grace that is a gift, uh, that is not predicated on any sort of response of obedience as its condition. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna lose that part of the story. Otherwise, it sounds like we're setting up these conditions that you have to cross a hurdle and then you're in, uh, but that's actually fundamentally antithetical to Christianity. Very good, thank you. Sorry if I misunderstood that question. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because, I mean, that, that goes to the heart of tolerance, right? I mean, that the end. Yeah, so, I mean, granted, without question, there have been configurations of societies in which Christians later, you know, added an additional thing, which is, if you don't believe as we believe, now there are going to be the, all these social repercussions for you or something like that. That's, that's quite different than... Um, telling uh, uh, an account of what they think is the, the destiny of an unbelieving soul. Do you write that? And, that, and I, would, I would say, insofar as societies set up that kind of intolerance for disbelief, uh, they fail to remember the principle of what I call the seculum, which is realizing that we live in this meantime and we don't expect to institute the kingdom here and now. I get your answer. Yeah, I get it. Okay, next, uh, Dr. Appia. With myriad external forces, how do you discern good from bad influences to exact, or I guess to create internal change? With myriad external forces, how do you discern good from bad influences? I mean, so that's, 
the central question of what philosophers would call moral epistemology. How do we, how do we come to recognize what is right and wrong? And I, I'm, I think the answer is uh, that, uh, like all the central questions, uh, there are many views about this and there's no consensus, but um, I think it's something that mostly we know how to do, that is to say, um, I think we know how to, um, I write a, an ethicist column for the New York Times, and usually what I find when people raise these questions for me is that they, uh, first of all, though they ask me a question, it usually has an answer built into it. <laughs> and if they, if they don't know what's right, it's because they fail to notice something. Uh, if you draw their attention to the relevant considerations, they usually know how those considerations weigh. They know that causing unnecessary harm counts against. They know that uh, generosity counts in favor. They know the truth is better than lies. They know all these things. Um, it's just that in complicated situations, these things may pull in different directions and they may find it hard to know how to balance them precisely. And often the way to solve, solve it is either to say, well, whatever you're going to do, I mean, I believe in this, that whatever you're going to do is going to be a problem. Uh, life is tragic. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't get a perfect outcome in many circumstances. But also, that, um, you know, if you'd noticed, if I drew your attention to this feature of the situation, which you didn't stress, you'll see that actually you okay, already so know what to do. So you're saying that basically we know what's good and bad. Like that, well, that the, there's a natural yes, law. No, 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 normal human beings. I mean, and is that how many, how, I mean, there are some things where we just can't figure out what to do. I mean, there, there, are, yes. there are many more, there are some difficult situations. Absolutely. How... Percentage-wise, are you saying it's, you know, I mean, just give, uh, what are you talking know, about, like? I don't know percentage-wise. 80 percent, it's like we know what to do, or is it more like 99 percent, and those other things are really the exception? Um, so just, just to be clear, I don't think that everybody is like this. You have to be raised in a, in a proper human so way. So it's not natural law, it's, it's nurturing. Um, well, it's natural because to raise people in those ways is natural. But, it's, but if you fail to do what's natural as a, social, as a society and as a parent and as a family, then you, that's one problem. And the other problem is that some people are, don't have brains properly constituted in these ways. Some people are psych sociopathic or psychopathic, and you can raise them properly, and they still won't latch on to the, the right thing. So I don't mean to say that there aren't preconditions, social and natural, for grasping these things. But for normal people, the people who have been properly raised and who have normal brains, in these respects. Um, usually, if it's a problem which is really, really hard, it's because it's objectively hard. There really are lots of relevant considerations, and, and it may be that reasonable people can differ about how to settle them. Okay, this is a great question about uh, parenting. I think there are a lot of parents in the room here. <laughs> Um, someone's thinking about having a baby. Okay, anyway, so this is a parenting question. At what point does a child come of age and reach a maturity level at which a parent who takes the posture of cosmopolitanism needs to be respectful of their child's differences? So, I'm a parent. You're a parent? You're a parent? No. Anyway, uh, so, okay, so, when, <laughs> when you're a parent, you kind of have to say this is the way it is for a long, for a lot of situations, a lot of the time. And I guess the question is, at what, at what point does cosmopolitanism have to kick in? And you have to like... Can I, can I yeah. just say, just take some heat off Anthony? I, I mean, I would say even as a Christian, at some point, I have to practice tolerance with my kids. So my, my kids are 23, 21, 19, and 17. So my, so my kids are... You know, I, so I've formed them in certain ways, but then actually there, at some point there becomes a certain trust and exercise of uh, entrusting them to God, is how I would articulate this, which also means that I have to give them the room for their own journey. And even when it takes detours that I'm like, I really wish you wouldn't go that way. In a sense, as a Christian parent, I am exercising tolerance 
or pa and patience, I would emphasize, and patience, as I'm waiting to see them navigate their own encounter with God, right? Um, I think that's absolutely crucial, and I think if you don't do that, that's actually one of the things that drives people away from faith. Because it you, makes it sound like you don't have the security or confidence uh, that God can do this work, that it depends on me. That is not Christianity. So I have two kids, and... Him. Right. Okay. Yeah, I win. I fool. <laughs> and this is this is true. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're definitely living the dream. <laughs> the day they're born, there's a stamp on them, and they're that person every single day of their life. Like they. What's the stamp? They're just them. Like like my daughter was Ava the moment she was born. You don't believe that? I believe that there's disposition. I feel like we're talking about a different question now, but clearly it's a mix of a kind of nature-nurture uh, dynamic right. without question. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. One more question. Okay, let me find a good one here. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, what would you say to a religious or atheistic person who holds a posture of conformity or homogeneity as opposed to a cosmopolitan posture? So this is a good question. This is the question I think, if I'm interpreting correctly, is, is um, you know, how do you how do you bring them over? How do you what what, what do you want to say to them to get them to consider being more cosmopolitan? Um, well, I think this I have will be the conclusion question. We'll give I, I a chance for the answer here, which is that uh, I do not believe that there is a um, kind of a priori uh, demonstrative proof that this is a good way to live. I think you just have to point to cosmopolitan experience, invite people into cosmopolitan experience. Now I'm sounding like a Christian inviting people to accept God's grace, but I think that. Uh, so I'd like to say that it's, um, my view is, it, it's caviar, not broccoli. <laughs> um, if I can just get you to acquire the taste, you'll definitely be better off uh, than you would be if you don't acquire it, I think, yeah. for most people. But I do believe that there is a kind of uh, form of life, I mentioned the Amish. There are some problems in many Amish communities, as there are in any community. So I'm not, I'm not idealizing them. But they have made a choice to live in an uncosmopolitan way. They don't want to know about the rest of us. They want to protect themselves from encounters with us because they think they've got all the answers uh, about, about the central questions. They, they're presumably aware of their fallibility because they're Christians, so they know that they, didn't, they aren't perfect. Um, that's, a, that's a thing, provided they let the kids who want to leave go, I say, they're entitled to that. And I'm not going to, I have no confidence that anything I could say would either actually persuade them or rationally compel them if they were reasonable to, to this point of view. And all we need in the world is enough people with this caviar taste, and we'll get along fine. They also have that party year, right? Yes. The Amish. Homespringen. <laughs> Yes, Which and that, is, that of course is, is related to what you said about, about, that, about the children. Yeah. Uh, th their view is, and that's why they're Mennonites, that's why they believe in adult baptism, they think that you can't accept the thing until you're a certain age, and that in order to accept it, you have to know something about the alternatives, right? And I believe both of those things. I think, yeah, I love in, in biblical traditions, what you've just described is what we would say is the dynamic of taste and see, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. So what, what I would probably want to do is point to powerful stories, evocative images of um, people giving themselves for the sake of others who differ, right? So, so uh, um, and in some ways, it would be stories of martyrdom and sacrifice, even for enemies, that I think have a powerful, evocative pull about them, right? To see, you know, uh, um, reformed Protestants in Le Chambon in France uh, um, making room for Jews during uh, the Second World War and, and sheltering them over, you know, deep differences. Um, 
and making sacrifices and risking so much to do that. I, I think um, those kinds of pictures of sacrifice, of people who are willing to die for the other, um, is it's something that captures your imagination. I don't think you're gonna, like, I, I totally agree with Anthony on these things. Even though we're philosophers, I think we both have a, a healthy view of the limits of rational demonstration. And what I would point to are images that evoke imagination and, and help us to imagine ourselves and the world otherwise. Thank you. Well, that draws our evening to a close. Uh, I hope that this has been food for your mind and your soul. Can we all join together in thanking our guests uh, for being here tonight and enlightening us? For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.